Okay, I think we are all ready to, to start. So thank you everyone for attending this, this session. It's really a, a pleasure for me to, to host uh, this, this session related with uh, UAS and, and UTM. So my name is Javier Lopez. I'm working for uh, Boeing Research and, and Technology Europe. I joined Boeing uh, 15 years ago and I'm working as a, as a research fellow in particular in the area of flight uh, operations and aircraft performances. Uh, today we have a really interesting uh, couple of presentations. So one, uh, the first presentation is related with um, altitude zoning for UTM. And the second one is um, capacity balance and the application for uh, urban air mobility and, uh, and man traffic management. So let's go first to our first speaker. So our first speaker is uh, Leonid Sedov. Uh, he's a, a PhD student from Linköping uh, University in Sweden. He works on airspace design and unmanned traffic management, and in particular in the area of airspace uh, capacity estimation and route optimization. So the full details and contact point of uh, Leonid, you can find it in the web application. Uh, so I'm really happy to, to have him here. And please, uh, Leonid, the, the floor is yours. Uh, you can start uh, when you can. Thank you. Thank you. I guess I need the host to stop sharing screen. Thank you. Now I will present the main results of our work on establishing different zones with similar altitudes for UTM. It is currently envisioned by many canopsis and research projects that future drones will be limited to very low level and controlled airspace to separate them from the general aviation. But drones flights are not only bounded from above, the noise, safety, privacy, and other concerns also put limitations on the minimum flyable altitude. These altitude requirements may differ between different countries, regions, or even different types of UTM airspaces. One issue that was raised by the Eurocontrol and EASA is the common frame of reference for UTM flight's height. The problem is that if drones will be following the constant altitude above ground level, they may need to follow a rather complicated trajectory. On the other hand, following the same altitude above mean sea level is not always possible, given the limitation on the maximum and minimum altitudes. Therefore, a common altitude reference system discussion document produced by Eurocontrol and EASA finds the most promising the approach where drones are supported by the UTM system to maintain the correct altitude. With the goal to help to establish the before mentioned common altitude reference system, we formulated and showed how to solve two computational problems. The first problem is about the terrain partitioning. And the idea is to partition a given terrain into rectangles so that in every rectangle, drones are able to fly on the same altitude above the mean sea level, so that they maintain the given flight altitude restrictions, that is, the minimum and maximum altitude. Or, in other words, we require that in every rectangle, the difference between the lowest and the highest points is less than the difference between the maximum and minimum allowed flight heights so that we can ensure that we can find an altitude that is feasible within the whole rectangle. This model is mostly interesting for applications in rural areas or small cities, where there are not so many tall buildings. We also studied the problem with urban partitioning, where we concentrated on big cities with tall buildings and skyscrapers. However, for now, I will concentrate on the rural terrain partitioning, and I will return to the urban version of the problem later. To solve this problem, 
we formulated it as a rather simple integer program. We consider terrain to be a grid and create a binary variable for every feasible rectangle, representing whether the rectangle is selected or not. We call a rectangle feasible if the difference between the lowest and the highest points is less than the difference between the maximum and minimum allowed flight altitudes. This way, we ensure that in every rectangle it is possible to pick an altitude which drones can follow within the rectangle while following the restrictions. Then, the IP objective is to minimize the number of selected rectangles, and the only constraint is that every point of the terrain grid must be covered by exactly one rectangle. We implemented the integer program and ran it on real 60 by 60 pixels terrain around x city in Sweden. We set the maximum difference to be 60 meters and obtained the picture presented on the right. We also experimented with other values of the difference between the highest and lowest points in rectangles. As expected, when we allow the higher height difference within a rectangle, fewer rectangles are needed. However, one of the main problems with IP is that it does not scale well with the problem size. 60 by 60 terrain was the limit we were able to solve in realistically appropriate time on a supercomputer node with almost 400 gigabytes of RAM and a powerful CPU. This is a rather small resolution, given that in our case every pixel covered 200 by 200 meters area. To deal with more high-resolution terrains, we developed a heuristic algorithm. The algorithm behind our heuristic is rather simple. We start from the bottom left corner and build a feasible rectangle with the maximum possible area. Not the tallest or the widest rectangle, but a feasible rectangle with the maximum possible area. Then we look at the uncovered part of the terrain and pick the most left point in the bottommost row. And again, draw a rectangle with the maximum area from there. We repeat the same step with finding the leftmost bottommost uncovered point, and once again draw a rectangle. As before, we once again look at the bottommost row in the uncovered part of the terrain and pick the leftmost corner as before, and draw the rectangle. We repeat the same procedure until we covered the whole terrain with rectangles. We implemented the heuristic and ran it on the same terrain as before. As a result, we obtained a similar picture, however, with a slightly higher number of rectangles used to partition the terrain. We also applied the heuristic to a high resolution 2500 by 2500 terrain and obtained a partition as presented on the right. Not surprisingly, Running the heuristic even on such a large problem took just several minutes, comparing to hours it takes to solve the IP on much smaller 60 by 60 instances. We also ran our heuristic on a bunch of randomly generated terrains and observed that heuristic is usually within two times the optimum obtained from the integer program. Now, it is time for the second problem of urban partitioning with a scenario with tall buildings. Using terrain elevation for the zoning is no longer feasible. Due to the height of skyscrapers and tall buildings, we would need to create a zone above every tall building to satisfy the height constraints. On the other hand, having just one constant altitude zone for the whole city, for example, above the height of the tallest building, would eat too much volume from the general aviation. So instead, we now focus on a different problem. 
We're no longer interested in finding the minimum number of rectangles, satisfying certain attitude difference conditions. Now we want to pack the whole city into a certain number of boxes in a way that takes away from the general aviation as less volume as possible. Additionally, we do not use the building's profiles directly. We instead fatten them by a certain distance. That represents the distance that drones need to maintain from the buildings. In our experiments, we assumed that drones should not fly within 50 meters of buildings. We formulated our problem as an integer program. Here, we create a binary variable for every possible rectangle. Different to terrain partitioning, we no longer have unfeasible rectangles. So we simply enlist all rectangles without looking at the maximum height difference. Our objective now is to minimize the total volume under the selected rectangles. And our constraints are that every point must be covered by exactly one rectangle and that at most k rectangles must be used. To experiment with our IP, we took real data for New York City center area around Empire State Building. We fattened all buildings by 50 meters. We then ran our integer program to cover 45 by 45 pixels area with 10 rectangles. The result is presented on the right picture. However, once again, we observed the same issue that IP is not able to solve more complicated problems. 45 by 45 pixels was essentially the maximum size of the terrain we have been able to deal with. To work with higher resolution terrains, we once again developed a heuristic. Our heuristic is based on simulated annealing approach and is as follows. We start with some initial temperature T. Then we throw randomly K minus one points where K is the number of rectangles we want to pack our city into. For example, if we want to pack our city into six rectangles, we throw five points. Now on the next step, we look at every point and cut the rectangle in which it lies into two different rectangles, alternating horizontal and vertical cuts. After cutting the region of interest into separate rectangles, using the randomly thrown points. We compute the objective value by summing the volumes under each of the rectangles. We then save the solution if the objective value is better than before. However, we also may randomly allow saving a solution even if the objective value is worse than during the previous iteration, when the value of temperature T is high. Then, after computing the objective value and saving the solution or not, we start preparing for the next iteration of the algorithm. We randomly wiggle the points to new places, where the value of temperature T defines within what distance can we move the points. We then decrease the value of temperature T and go to the next iteration starting from the step two where we cut the zone of interest into multiple rectangles. When the value of t becomes low enough, we simply stop the algorithm and return the best solution we have obtained. We implemented the heuristic and ran it on the same instance as the integer program before. The result on the right is quite similar to the IP, but it took less than a second to compute this on a personal computer. Comparing to the hours the IP was running on the supercomputer node. We also tried running our heuristic on a high resolution 2000 by 2000 pixels instance. Once again, 
our heuristic completed in no time. The fact that the heuristic was so quick allowed us to decrease the influence of the random nature of the algorithm on the results by running the same heuristic on the same instance thousands of times to obtain and pick the best solution among the thousands of runs. Additionally, we tested our urban heuristic on 20 different instances obtained from New York buildings data. We observed that in all our instances, the heuristic performed within 20% of the optimum computed using IP. In conclusion, I will reiterate that we have formulated and solved two different problems of partitioning rural terrains and urban areas into constant attitude zones. We developed precise but slow IP formulations and quick heuristics with no guarantees on the solution quality. We hope our work will help your control and or ICARUS project in their important mission of establishing common altitude reference system for UTM. There are several future research alleys. First of all, a good question is taking into account how drones should transition between zones. It might be a good idea to post-process zones to smoothen the transition between rectangles or make adjustments into the IP or algorithms to ensure that the difference between adjacent rectangles is less than some number. Secondly, it might be interesting to take the traffic into account and design zones with respect to actual traffic patterns so that to minimize the number of crossings between rectangles or something similar. Another possible area of research is dividing an airspace into non-rectangular zones or maybe even going into the realm of geovectoring. And last but not least, it might be interesting to experiment with the grid rotation. Some areas, such as for example New York, may benefit from that, given the grid-like pattern of the streets. And uh, thank you all for listening. I hope you have left many interesting questions for Thank you. Uh, thank you, Leonie, for a very, very interesting uh, presentation. So uh, I really want to break the ice a little bit uh, because here in your conclusions, you are mentioning like uh, some potential um, future work that uh, could be done. So my question to you is, I don't know if you can give us a glimpse, uh, an idea of uh, how would you tackle uh, some of those um, some of those uh, future work, right? Like, uh, for example, the transition between uh, zones or maybe like uh, changing the, 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 the shape or the, instead of being rectangular, maybe being polygons. So uh, can you elaborate a little bit on, on the future work? Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, thank you. So, um... First of all, it is, of course, uh, not clear how far it will all go. Uh, this is possible future work, not necessarily what I will be doing. Uh, however, nevertheless, there are numerous ways to tackle these problems. So, uh, I mean, rotating the grid is as simple as it gets. So just try to rotate the grid and uh, see what changes when we when we look at our geographical, uh, our region of interest from a different angle. With uh, non-rectangular zones, uh, well, there are also several uh, other approaches. Maybe we can try to build a Voronoi diagram, maybe uh, of points. Maybe we can try to divide into uh, some non-convex polygons. So it is uh, there are there are numerous possibilities of uh, of uh, doing that. And uh, of course, it might be of more interest to to look at uh, how we can uh, how we can employ traffic information. Uh, maybe uh, maybe there will be uh, uh, many drones cross crossing from one zone to another zone, and maybe it will be more beneficial to have those zones uh, uh, to to merge those zones at the expense of uh, other zones and. Uh, Etc. Etc. 
So I, I do not have clear answer how to tackle all of them. However, I believe that it is possible. So uh, I have some questions from the audience and also through the uh, web application. So uh, the first question is related to the integration between uh, UTM and, and ATM, right? I mean, here you are, of course, talking about uh, altitude zoning, uh, mainly for UTM. So do you, do you have any thoughts of uh, when uh, everything will be handled into the ATM, let's say, man airspace? Um well uh, no <laughs> i i'm not sure if anyone has any clear answer to how utm or a utm and atm will be integrated and that is a big question in in the research community and uh, in community in general i i'm not sure if anyone knows well how it will be done with with any certainty uh yes and uh when will we start removing air traffic controllers from the system? Well, I guess uh, in terms of UTM, the ultimate goal is to not have them and uh, is to never introduce them in the first place. But yes, we will see how it works. I'm, I'm, not, uh, I'm not a decision maker and uh, this is not up to me. Sure. So uh, an additional question is, uh, is uh, Andrew, he's asking about uh, the grid pattern of the streets in New York. I mean, do you expect a better result with the annealing grid age parallel to the street or non-parallel? Uh, I would say so. Uh, I, I would expect better results if uh, the grid pattern of streets are is aligned with uh, with the uh, with the rectangle so yes I, I i think it would be it it can be beneficial since we will be enclosing buildings in a more clear way got it uh, another question is from bruno he's asking about um, how to connect like the different zones i mean once you create those altitudes uh, are you expecting like there will be some kind of corridor to move from one zone to another zone? I mean, uh, do you have any thought of how that connection could happen? Uh, well, that is a good question. And uh, I guess it might be more of a fine tuning of uh, building some bridges, uh, like diagonal bridges between adjacent zones or maybe tackling it in some different way, maybe just requiring drones to change the altitude if the difference is not so, uh, is not so big. Uh, I, I, am, I do not have clear answer right now. And it is certainly a, a good question how it, how it should be, uh, how the transition between zones should be smooth and how it can be done to, to improve it. Maybe we have uh, time for a last question. Maybe I will ask that. I, and in case that uh, someone posts any question, maybe we'll have some time for an additional one. So my question is, I mean, here, of course, you are uh, looking at um, altitudes that they are fixed in, in space and time, right? Like uh, buildings, mountains. How about if we are thinking here, for example, about uh, some weather conditions that can be used, for example, to establish some altitude zones. So like dynamic, uh, how this algorithm could work with the time dimension for that uh, zoning? Hmm. Um, that is definitely a good question. So I have not thought about that. One, one thing that we did was that uh, we created those heuristics which run quickly so in in some way we can uh, we, we can have some probabilistic weather map i believe i i believe uh, we can predict with what certainty where will be some uh, bad weather conditions at least as, as far as i know and uh, well maybe we can employ that uh, and uh, try to build zones with uh, uh, with uh, taking uh, the, into the account the probability of observing bad weather conditions. Uh, additionally, uh, it is it might be possible uh, to 
reconstruct uh, the uh, rectangulation frequently. Uh, so if, if we have uh, quickly raining heuristics, nothing essentially, and, and good communication with drones, of course, nothing essentially stops us from, from changing the rectangulation frequently. The other question is, of course, what drones should do if they were in some zone which then changed after we changed the uh, the rectangulation. Well, that's a good question <laughs> from me to me. And uh, yes, it, it it all can probably be done and just should be tactile, I believe. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Leonid, for, for answering the, the questions and for the rest of the audience. Um, okay. uh, in Wobble, you have the link to connect with Leonid. Thank you very much uh, for, for your time and very, very interesting uh, presentation. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So maybe we can go now to our next speakers. Uh, so I don't know uh, if uh, directly uh, we can give the the ball to uh, Pablo or Chris. Uh, Bram, uh, let me know. If yes, you of can. course. Yes, of course. Thank you. So in the meantime, let me introduce to the next uh, couple of speakers that they're going to talk about uh, demand capacity balancing uh, for US space. So it's going to be a, a presentation done in conjunction between uh, Pablo Sanchez Escalonilla and Chris uh, Forster. Uh, Pablo, Pablo is a technical manager at CRIDA. Uh, he received his uh, master's degree in aeronautical engineer from Polytechnic, Polytechnic University of Madrid. He has uh, over 20 years of experience in ATM research. He has been involved in multiple research topics dealing with the uh, design and assessment of new ATM uh, solutions. Within the UAV field, he has involved in the demo, demo RPAS and Ariadna life trials, first project addressing the integration of RPAS in non-segregated airspace in Spain. He has also participated in the design of uh, US spaces uh, through the Impetus and Dacus project, both of them researching advanced US space services. He has also part of the Corus Advisory Board. In Spain, he has coordinated uh, the project that is addressing requirements of the Alman aircraft, uh, aircraft System Traffic Management within the innovation plan of the Spanish Ministry of uh, Public Works and Transport. And he participated in the validation of this system through the Domus uh, project. I might also add, add that uh, I collaborated with, with Pablo in the past in several uh, European projects, so I have the, the pleasure to work with, with him. And also we have uh, our additional speaker will be uh, Chris uh, Forster. He's uh, the Chief Operating Officer at Altitude Angel. For those that they don't know this company, I mean Altitude Angel is an aviation technology company that is delivering uh, solutions that facilitate safe routine integration of unmanned aircraft into uh, airspace. Uh, their products provide uh, US space services and unmanned traffic management through reliable, safe, and innovative solutions for uh, airspace regulators, air navigation service providers, uh, drone manufacturers, uh, operators, etc. Chris is uh, passionate uh, about uh, both aviation and technology. He has a master's of engineering degree in computer science and cybernetics. He has worked in the technology industry for over 16 years. And prior to joining Altitude Angel, Chris worked at uh, Microsoft for 10 years, where he held both consulting and leadership positions, focused on helping enterprise customers delivering their full potential with their help of uh, technology. So uh, thank you, uh, both, of, uh, both of you, for this presentation. And feel free, Pablo, to start. Thank you. OK, so thank you. Thank you for the introduction, Javier. And, and thank you to all attendees for coming to this session. No? We are going to talk today about towards a continuous demand and capacity balancing process for US space. And, and really, in particular, we will talk about two of the advanced uh, US space services, or the EU3 US, US space services, which are the tactical conflict resolution and the dynamic capacity management. Uh, both services really are close related to each other, as uh, we will see in a few minutes. And that's why we are linking two projects uh, that uh, can be complemented, uh, as, as we will see also. 
But uh, okay, before going into the details of our research, I would like to show you uh, why we are working together in these two services. And for this, I would like to extract uh, one of the sentences of the Corus concept of operation, no? of the US space concept of operation. The level of confidence in how well the tactical conflict resolution will work can be matched to the difficulty of the task the service faces by limiting the number of flights in a particular volume of fire. No? This is the, the job of the dynamic capacity management service. In other words, uh, if the tactical conflict resolution works properly, uh, assuming uh, some remaining level of risk, let's say, uh, it will be possible uh, to increase the number of operations, the number of drones operating in a certain area. This is the, the relation. No? And, and well, uh, within this area, uh, we would like to explain, we would like to present the results of two different projects. No? The first one was Impetus. Impetus was a project that started uh, two years ago and finished this year, uh, which is which was addressing well, within a wider scope, but, but in particular in this topic, we were addressing uh, the tactical conflict resolution service and the implementation of the dynamic uh, separation criteria, uh, taking benefit of this uh, diversity of drones, uh, diversity of missions that will exist in the, in the drones arena. Uh, we have linked uh, this work with what is the potential impact on the number of drones that are acceptable in a certain air space, which is the work of the dynamic capacity management. But uh, going beyond this, uh, we are now working on an additional project, which is called DACUS, that has started right now and will finish in two years, that tries to integrate tactical conflict resolution within a wider context in which a continuous demand and capacity balancing process uh, will be defined. And uh, well, I will give the floor now to Chris that will explain the exercise, the experiments that we perform addressing tactical conflict resolution in impetus. And then I will go into the next steps into the, 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 the DACUS project. So please, Chris, the, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Pablo, and good morning, everyone. Um, so, uh, as Pablo indicated, we participated in the Impetus project um, from 2017 to 2019, um, and Altitude Angel really led the, the research into how we can start enhancing some of those early tactical uh, conflict resolution services uh, that, were, that were available at the time. Um, and fr from our point of view, um, tactical conflict resolution is all about managing the airspace uh, and the separation in real time. So we're not really looking at uh, pre-flight, i.e. the strategic deconfliction, very much focused on the, 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 the in-flight type separation. Uh, as a starting point, we really uh, looked at uh, field theory principles um, that have been used in previous research around standard separations. Uh, and while we didn't use the uh, specific algorithms, we did use the, the principles that, that form part of that to recraft the approach to look at how we can dynamically adapt the separation of, of, of airspace between drones or, or, or um, restrictions to maximize the efficiency of that airspace uh, as it becomes busier. Um, the Impetus project also looks very heavily at a microservices approach and the, uh, the tactical conflict resolution service was one of those services. Um, but we also wanted to, to explore the safety, kind of the failure modes and recovery, the scalability and the data management aspects that uh, the microservices approach could support. Uh, and that was part of the testing and experiments that we, that we did as well as part of the, the, the project. So um, just by way of a background, so um, this is a, a very simple um, visualization of, uh, of, I guess, the field theory. If, if you think about um, two, two magnets with a positive force, as they come closer together, they, they will start to repel. Uh, and, and this is kind of what we thought we'd apply a a, a, a field around each of the drones so when they come into conflict we can have a smooth transition in and out of that that conflict and keep keep the drones safe while helping them maintain their mission criteria and and, and waypoint destination so um, that that really for, for, form part of it uh, and then we look at the um the, the implementation so that the, the tactical deconflictor service had a number of inputs this was, this was very important to us uh, we've shown just a few on, on, on the diagram here, but surveillance, things like airspace information, things like environmental, like weather, for example, but also the flight information and any information relating to the drone undertaking that flight all fed into this deconflictor service. Uh, and then throughout, we, we maintained the situational picture um, at regular intervals, 
which led to analysis being done upon that and then commands based on vectoring of those drones to the uh, to, to, to the desired um, waypoint to, to avoid the conflict, which were passed back to either the drone in the simulator or in the simulator, a, a simulated human pilot, if you like, because there's still probably that hybrid hybrid approach um, approach there. So for the uh, simulations, um, we really thought about the chorus conop. So uh, really looked at the, the busy environment being things like the, the type ZU, the Z urban, or, or the, potentially even the ZA airspace types. And we simulated the 60 square kilometer uh, simulation zone up to, um, up to a 400 foot um, altitude. Um, and then linearly increased the amount of drones over a number of different experiments over, over that time. Now, what was very important and a key part of the research for us was to actually start weighting those drones um, or, or objects in the airspace or um, constraints in the airspace uh, based on a number of different parameters. So, so, for example, if we have a very good situational awareness level, so we have very good visibility of what's happening in the airspace, uh, maybe there's uh, radar type systems, maybe there are um, uh, other, other sensory information on top of e conspicuity, we'd have a really good confidence in the situational awareness level that was, was, was happening there. And, and we could potentially reduce the separation requirements um, because we'd have more confidence in each of, the, uh, each of the locations. The same applies for the environmental situation. So if the weather, for example, is, is, uh, is, is good uh, versus the weather is bad, we might uh, adapt the, uh, the, the separation level like they do, for example, at airports today. Uh, and then looking at drone capabilities. Um, sorry, I think we skipped forward there too, too much. If we look at drone capabilities, um, we, we look at um, whether the drone is human piloted or it's, uh, it's, it's automated, whether it's a rotary or whether it's a fixed wing. And then what sort of co uh, communication coverage, so how quickly can we, we see and communicate back to that drone? Are we talking over a, a, a cellular 4G connection? Uh, or, or something so, or, or even faster, and what is the coverage and uh, reliability of that, that communication. And all of these things can be used to kind of weight um, the, the drones and, and decide on a separation level. And, and that, that's what we applied through the project. And in the experiments, looked at different, different types of, uh, of these characteristics for, for the simulation. So if we go through to the next slide, just a couple of, I guess, really simple graphics to show in this example, a fixed wing and rotary drone, uh, how, how potentially those fields change. It's not just about uh, the size of those fields, it's the shape, it's, it's the size and uh, it's the strength of those fields that is, is really important to this, uh, to this principle. If we go to the next slides, um, you can see an example of actually the weather changing during a flight. Actually, we would just want to simply increase the separation around each of the drones to give you that little bit further confidence if there's, if there's winds and, and that drone is unable to keep to its conformance. So um, as I said, we didn't uh, stick specifically to the, the field algorithms. We did we did tune tune those uh, based on on the principles themselves. But the objectives of the experiments that we'll show today, um, which are a subset of those conducted within Impetus, were to look at how we manage conflicts with other drones, how drones can leave res newly restricted areas. So if a, a temporary flight restriction or a future version of that comes into place during flight, how do we manage that? Uh, and, and we'll also discuss briefly uh, the, um, the dependence uh, reliability of the service based on both data providers as well as the first party um, uh, hosting solution. So in, in, in the first result, as we increased the number of drones um, uh, in, in the system and, and, and the drones had to cross um, or, or, or have a certain distance uh, to cover across a threshold. So well, we didn't involve strategic deconfliction up front, we were looking to see actually how these drones reacted to a conflict situation. Uh, and, and as the number of drones in the system increased, we had more of those conflicts occurring. Um, within the, the project, we used a very num a various different numbers of weightings, which we're not saying are, are the most optimal today, but certainly can be improved over time as we, as we collect more evidence in, in the real world. Uh, but with a conservative set of weights applied to each of those to ensure, ensure safety, uh, we're able to show as we increase that drone uh, amount to around a thousand, um, no less than kind of a, a deviation average of 22% of to the mission efficiency. Um, now, obviously, based on whoever's the business running the mission, this would make it feasible or not, um, based on things like the endurance of the drone and the location of the waypoints. 
but we thought it was a, a good, good way to, to show how, um, how that test had been conducted. In the second result, um, we showed um, the, the, the temporary flight restriction. We had a number of these created uh, over between one, one and 10 kilometers, uh, square kilometers, uh, um, again, with it, probably a ceiling of, I think it was uh, a thousand, thousand feet. Um, and we showed actually those drones that have passed the, the halfway point through the uh, restricted zones were able to continue and leave that, uh, that area. But if, if we hadn't quite got there, we needed to find a way to, to remove those drones in a quick and effective manner. Now, the rule set might say you need to land, um, but we took the assumption for the experiments that you just need to leave as safely and as effectively as possible from a restricted zone. Uh, and that's why they really follow the path back out, because they've been there before. Um, they're unlikely to need to deconflict again or, or on the way back out of, of that restricted area. And then the, the final result to share, I, I guess, with um, for the presentation today, is really how we um, how we deployed this. We, we used a kind of a cloud infrastructure, and you've got the concept of essentially different clusters which uh, sit around hosting the service and a number of nodes. Uh, and we show that the 80% 80, 80 capacity of load on the system, that with a, a failure of one of those nodes, so 25% of the nodes within that cluster, we were able to maintain a, an ongoing state and then recover that node without any impact at all. Um, where the cluster failed completely, um, so um, uh, we, we found that we need, obviously needed to stand, stand that back up, which took one or two minutes, which for this sort of service is probably not acceptable. So the deployment for such a safety or future safety uh, service would need to be deployed across multiple clusters and, uh, and, and data centers to make sure it worked in kind of an active, active configuration. Uh, and then really uh, the, the, final, the final result here was actually, we talked about in that architecture diagram, certain dependent services and weather was one of those um, uh, that, that fed into this to help us build up that situational picture. Um, when those services go down, um, we were able to show that actually we were able to increase the separation around the drone while that service was offline um, and then look for other, other alternative services through a discovery service um, to, to bring kind of the, the full efficiency back to the system as quickly as possible. So that, that's my side. I'll pass back to Pablo now for some conclusions. Okay, thank you very much, Chris. So let's go into the conclusions. Uh, some of them I'll really link uh, to the next step in the process now with the overall uh, dynamic capacity management uh, process. Uh, the first one, it seems that it is feasible to manage dynamically the separation. No? It is possible to define a dynamic uh, separation depending on a set of uh, diverse factors that will exist in the drones uh, arenas, the diversity of drones operations, the diversity of missions, uh, CNS performances, and so on. Uh, this is one point. But on the other hand, something that for us it was a, a surprise is that maybe we need to take into account other factors to limit the capacity uh, beyond this uh, idea of uh, keeping safety. No? And, and uh, would you have seen an example uh, with this idea of losing efficiency as soon as the tactical conflict resolution is working with more drones? Uh, so maybe the tactical conflict resolution is working properly, but however, it is necessary to limit the number of drones in a certain area, because in other case, there will be missions that cannot be performed uh, according to the expectations. This is one of the points. Uh, the other one is this idea of defining a deterministic uh, management of failure modes. Uh, we will have uh, several services interacting one to each other. Uh, some of them will provide uh, relevant information in order to improve the performance of the tactical conflict resolution. But we need to take into account that if we lose these uh, supporting services, let's think, for instance, on weather uh, data, this could imply that we need to increase the separation between drones, and this should be deterministically managed. <coughs> And well, the last one is, is also a question for you. Uh, we have seen that there is a wide diversity of uh, factors which are impacting the dynamic uh, separation. And, and we think that it will be difficult for the human to manage uh, this uh, type of dynamic separation in a high density environment, no? thinking on the future with high density of drones in urban environments. And maybe this could imply that automation 
in this type of processes, in this type of systems is a must. We don't see that the uh, managing high number of drones, uh, it is possible to, to, well, to assume that the, there will be one single role with the whole, uh, let's say, responsibility on separation. This is the point. And well, uh, all these conclusions will be taken into account for the next steps. And as I said before, the next steps are uh, to define an overall demand and capacity balancing process. And I have uh, shown, I would like to show a picture that identifies the set of services involved in these overall processes apart from the tactical conflict resolution. So imagine that time ahead the operation, you will have several operation plans that will be submitted to the system. Some of them will for sure will be available, but others not. Uh, we will have several services which integrates these operational plans, uh, check, for instance, that there is no conflict between pairs of them. This will be a work of the strategic conflict resolution. And, well, they will be submitted and validated into the system. Uh, we think that probably it will be necessary to combine this demand, which is already known, which some unknown demand in order to take measures in, adva in, in advance. No? And uh, imagine that, for instance, uh, we are able to, to analyze uh, what are the delivery uh, requests uh, in an urban environment dealing with uh, the submission of food, for instance, and we can combine these existing operation plans with uh, this unknown demand in order to have a more reliable picture time ahead uh, or before the operations. This is one area, the area of uh, improving the demand prediction. The other area is the area of capacity characterization. And here you have to think that we are not talking about uh, capacity as it is known in the air traffic management. Uh, probably there will be some sort of dynamic uh, maximum number of drones in a certain area, which will probably depend on the risk of collision with man of aviation, with people on ground, and well, the risk of collision will determine what are the number of drones which are acceptable in that area. So we think that it will be necessary to combine several models in order to characterize the capacity for US space. The collision risk model that I have just mentioned, but also probably some societal impact model that will analyze what could be the impact of noise uh, for the population, what could be the, well, for instance, the input, the input or the, the impact on, on, the, on the visual acceptance of the drones operating in a certain area, and this could be a limiting factor which is not totally related to, to safety, no? to risk. Uh, after having the demand and the capacity, uh, we will balance uh, into a service which is called the dynamic capacity management. And in this service, it will be necessary to take into account, in the case of urban environments, what are the urban air rules, what are the air space structures which uh, are or exist in an urban environment, and probably it will be necessary to define a new performance framework, no? a, new, a new set of indicators that will allow to monitor the overall system. And well, finally, there is another link that we, in which uh, we have been talking in this session, no? the link with the tactical conflict resolution and this idea of defining dynamic separation minima. This is the overall concept that will be addressed by, by DACUS. You can see that we are addressing several services in, in this overall process, and that's why, okay, we have defined several coordination mechanisms focused on specific research areas to coordinate with external stakeholders, to coordinate with aerospace users, and also even with other external projects. There will be a research area, a coordination group, which is called Separation and Associated CNS Requirements. In this group, we will work about or we will talk about uh, what are the factors impacting separations, as I said, uh, as we have explained in this session. Then there will be a group working on the DCB process and the performance metrics that will monitor the overall process. We will answer here questions about the type of DCB measures which could be applicable in new space. It will be necessary to better understand these business models especially in urban environments. And this will imply that uh, it is necessary to define when operation plans will be available in order to improve our demand predictions. 
And finally, something which is very relevant is what is the regulatory framework in these urban environments. And in this case, we need to understand what are the boundary conditions, no? what are the future constraints in this type of environments that will determine how we will manage this overall process of well, managing the demand against the capacity. And well, that's all. Thank you for your attention. These are the contacts uh, for Impetus and for DACUS. Of course, uh, we can answer your questions and not only in this session, but also, uh, well, if you can want to contact with us or to participate in this work in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Pablo. Thank you, Chris. It was a really, really interesting uh, presentation. So congratulations. <laughs> So uh, I have uh, one uh, question before I go to, to the question that has been uh, put in the question and answer uh, panel. So my question is um, about uh, how the, from your perspective, the equipage of a, of a drone will affect uh, cap uh, demand and capacity balance and also separation. And related to that also about contingency management, meaning that uh, maybe let's say the separation rules depending on the equipage of also depending if, for example, there are some contingency management happening at the level of that U uh, space or, or maybe uh, uh, thanks to the automation within the, within the drone, how, how it will affect uh, this demand and capacity balance? That's a great, great question. Um, Pablo, do you want to tell anyone? Do you want me to, to jump in? Well, uh, maybe you can talk about the tactical conflict resolution impact and I will talk about the demand and capacity. So, so we definitely covered um, the equipage within the, um, the, the planning that we had, uh, the, the research that we did. We, we looked at uh, everything from kind of e-conspicuity, so the ability of a drone to broadcast its location, um, all the way through to how many um, kind of backup systems that is. So, so for example, if you had uh, maybe uh, something like ADSB. Um, on board the drone, but also an, an LTE data connection. Uh, you would have two connections then back to, to verify, I guess, your location, so it's the right ground station, uh, and, and we could correlate the two together. Um, the separation for that may be uh, less than if, if we didn't necessarily have a reliable positioning information. Uh, again, um, the ability to communicate back to the drone itself. Um, I would also think the type of drone is very important too. Uh, so for example, a fixed wing drone can't just kind of hover, it needs to kind of circle or loiter around, whereas a fixed wing drone, you can almost almost uh, come to a, an air stop, if, if you like, um, while, while the situation can be recovered. So I, I would say, obviously, the, the more equipage the, the drone has, and the more advanced the drone, the likelihood, although not in all cases, the likelihood is that, that separation is, is we able to reduce that over time as we understand the safety impacts. Um, and therefore increase the capacity of, of that airspace. Uh, but we all, all must also understand that the capacity will be, um, there may be unexpected things in the airspace and we need the ability to, to reduce the capacity in the case of that to, to ensure ongoing safety. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, to complement this, this answer and taking into account the findings that uh, were explained by Chris, uh, we are thinking on that. DCB process in which there could be specific measures which allow to increase the capacity by imposing several constraints to the equipment of the drones. So this implies that, for instance, if you see an, an imbalance you know, in an area, you can say, okay, in this case, I will need to impose that drones will be equipped in, that, in this way, and this will imply that I, can, I will be able to increase the capacity. But let's say that, for me, the philosophy is, let's say, as flexible as possible, but if there is a constraint, maybe it, if it if it is if there is a problem between the demand and capacity, we need to impose constraints. This is the, the overall idea. Uh, we are answering the first question, but the, the, can, can you remind us the second one, please, uh, Javier? Because <laughs> no, no, it was uh, basically on um, equipage and also contingency man management, right? If there are ah. some contingency management, uh, let's say in, in place either at the level of the drone or at the level of the US space, maybe it will have a, an effect. Yes, so, yes. But uh, we have a, a, a few uh, questions from, from the audience. I mean, if later we have some time, definitely we can come back to, to this one, but I don't want uh, um, to prioritize minds. So there is one question from Alex Kowalski is, uh, 
is expected that the UTM will issue commands at the autopilot or it will provide a constraint that's say equivalent to the current ATC uh, philosophy, right? Like uh, you provide recommendations or, or commands and then it's the pilot, the one that executes it. So how is that debate? <laughs> yeah, that's a great question. So um, I, I think I think it will change over time. So so today there's there's not really a legal framework necessarily to take control of a drone. I mean we have things like geofencing to to stop a drone accessing an area, but actually to take control of that drone is probably not not ready yet. Um, but we have to remember we're, we're living in a world with primarily human piloted drones with a limited level of automation on board. Uh, and, and, and it being piloted by, by, by human as we go forward and as we scale this industry, we're going to see more and more automation. So I, I, I definitely say today, yes, it is a recommendation to a pilot. Um, obviously, for our research, we looked at future states as well. It wasn't just about here and now. It was looking uh, three, five, ten years in the future. Um, I, I'd say the next stage after that, which we've demonstrated in, in live trials, actually, um, we, was the ability to kind of issue to a to a ground control station with a, with a UI to say the, the UTM system would like to take this action um, and then have um, the, the pilot decide whether that action can be forwarded on to the, to, to the, to the drone itself. Um, uh, and then I guess you, you've got that equivalent, if I understand it right, the TCAS system on board an aircraft, whereas it, when that, if that instruction is not acknowledged, then the action will be taken. I kind of see that as a, a step. But then, yes, absolutely. In the future, um, once the, the frameworks are all in place and, and the uh, certification levels, etc., then then yes, I see the UTM actually issuing commands directly to a drone um, in in that future state. Yes, thank you. And and to complement this with respect to the DCB, uh, this is a point that we have been discussing internally in DACUS, no? And and really, uh, what we want to avoid is a never-ending process. Uh, this implies that, for instance, talking about the strategic conflict resolution, which is part of the process, uh, if there is no uh, critical uh, changes in the in the trajectory of the pairs of drones which are in conflict, uh, the idea is let's try to propose some alternatives to the aerospace user in order to decide which of the alternatives uh, can be can be accepted by them. No? This is uh, one approach with respect to the strategic conflict resolution. But however, with respect to the DCB measures to be implemented, uh, what we initially think is that probably it will be necessary to identify the constraints and let the aerospace users to decide where to fly, taking into account those constraints. But, but okay, the, the, the risk on this is to, to, to have a never-ending process in which there is no a final a consensus on the on, on how they will fly no? and that's why okay it's a very challenging and very very interesting question that we are addressing within DACUS. Thank you, thank you. Um, we have a last question coming from Xavier from uh, he's talking about if, he's the, uh, if we have a possible way to distribute uh, with let's say with several UTM providers the conflict uh, the tactical resolution and also the uh, demand and capacity balance will yep. be like several providers uh, it, with yeah again a, a very good question um i think there's obviously lots of discussion around um how much of the capability um needs to be distributed uh, and, and if any any needs to be centralized um i think that that's still a discussion playing out uh, around the world in, in different ways as well um I would, I would, um, in, in Europe, we use the kind of the CIS and, and US, USS or USP model, um, where, where the centralized piece sits probably within the CIS itself. I would say to answer the question, um, the important factor is the situational awareness. So if each of those uh, entities running as a, as a UTM provider can have a full situational picture, then yes, it is possible to distribute the service in, in, in some way, actually down to, to the drone level either, even. Um, it's whether nations will be happy for, um, for a broad view of a situational awareness or whether there are is restricted air traffic that they, they wouldn't necessarily want to, to share, share more broadly. So yeah, I, I think it very much depends on, on, on how the authorities and, and regulators choose to, to run that in a specific country. But um, yes, a tactical deconfliction absolutely can work in a distributed way as well, and, and the same principles of applying weights to to drones within that um, within that environment could could work. 
Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chris, Pablo. Uh, I think we have gone through all the, the questions that we have from the audience.